After the Rosilla episode, I was grounded for the entire summer, and Mama promptly went and bought Mary Liza a new doll baby. For the next few days, I wasn't allowed to eat at the table with the rest of the family, and I was made to eat alone on the porch, even when company was over. One day, we had a large group of folks over, and my cousin Maggie Bell saw me out there alone and decided to sneak me away for a walk. Now, this particular household of folks was so little to Cousin Maggie's liking that she got away as soon as lunch was over, taking me, a willing captive, with her. Furthermore, she had stolen Bud, my baby brother, from the floor of the kitchen where he was playing as the adults were cleaning the kitchen. Bud chuckled and crowed and squealed as if he were the heart and the head and the front of the joke while we scampered down the middle garden walk hidden by the tall azalea bushes and made it to the rail fence at the lower end without being spotted. Maggie Bell made me climb over first and she lowered Bud carefully into my arms before she leaned her weight upon the two hands laid at the top rail and whirled over the fence like an acrobat. Heck, she could outrun half the boys and outjump them too. The ground was dipping abruptly below the garden into a level stretch of the old field where the broom straw came up to my armpits, their yellowing waves parting before and closing behind with a surge and a swish of a gentle surf. They smelled sweet and they felt soft as Maggie Bell let Bud down from her shoulders, making a hammock with her arms and swung him back and forth through the pilot stems as he choked with ecstasy. Beyond the old field was the old orchard. The new orchard was planted nearer to the house and was in full bearing, and Paul made little account of such fruit from the old orchard, mostly choke pears and apples from the unpruned trees that were enterprising enough to grow and ripen without tending or harvesting. The trunks of the trees were shrouded with knobs, and the branches were such that it made climbing the easiest sort of work and swinging on them an irresistible temptation. Up in the higher branches, there were coney forks where one could sit, read, and even sleep without the danger of falling. Me and my troop of imaginary friends had spent one whole July Saturday in and under this big tree. When the apples were beginning to ripe, I was Elijah, and my imaginary friends were the ravens who piled me with all the sweets until I couldn't have swallowed another one to save the combined kingdoms of Judah and Israel. I was sick all night after the feast, but I bore no grudge for my misplaced confidence in the human stomach. Presently, we three runaways were camped down underneath the broading branches. The untrimmed turf was as thick and dry as a parlor carpet. Bud crawled lawlessly about, picking up twigs and pebbles and testing his first four teeth on them. But he was a good baby, never swallowing anything that he couldn't bite into. His real name was William Skipworth Burwell. Uncle Lewis had named him Rosebud during the first moon of his existence, and the abbreviation was inevitable. Just like that, he would probably remain Bud for the rest of his days. Maggie Bell threw herself down at full length on the grass and pillowed her bright head upon her arms and stared contently up into the apple tree. That's more like it, she breathed. I sat down beside her, my short legs tucked underneath me like a wild child. That was one of the things I liked about being outside, especially with my cousin. I could sit cross-legged because if I forgot my manners like that at the house, my ma would pull my legs straight out in front of me and pop me with a stick, reminding me that I was going to be a young lady one day, like it or not. I had always looked up to Maggie Bell. She was feisty and independent. Her eyes were full of laughter and laziness, and the color in her cheeks was that of velvet perpetual rose, shading into peach and then into pure white that never took on freckles or a tan from the hottest sun. Her hair was auburn and curled like great tendrils from the nape of her neck to her forehead. In the shade, it looked like a perfectly groomed bay horse. And when the sun struck it, it got all alive as if there were light under it as well as over it. And it was unmistakably red. She made more fun of it than anybody else. But at heart, she loved her hair. And she wouldn't have exchanged it for any paley gold or ebony tresses. A thick curl strayed over her arm bare almost to her shoulder, as was the warm weather custom of ladies in that time. 
She drew it around before her eyes, thinning it into a silky veil, holding it up high, letting it slip strand by strand between her and the light. I sure love being out here with you, Maggie Bell. I'd much rather be out here than in the house, talking to all of them. I tell you, I'm tired of them all, especially Mary Liza. I feel like I'm a prisoner in that house. But in that moment, as I was about to open my heart, I jumped and gave a little squeak. Maggie Bell, there's a praying mantis on you. He had tumbled out of the apple tree upon the folds of her skirt. And before I could capture him, a second one fell on her. I was up and on my feet in a twinkling, and I seized the first one and then the other and held them up between my fingers as they were kicking and sprawling. Oh, I knew the tricks and the ways of the praying mantis because when they weren't foraging or fighting, they would sit upon their hind quarters and fold their legs as if they were praying. I'd caught dozens of them and fed them for days in a box that I kept hidden in my bedroom. I had coarse lace tied over the top to prevent escape, and there I studied their habits, and I would even humor myself by putting several of them together in their little prison that became an arena. Mama would find my secret box and release them in the yard before scolding me. What's wrong with you, Molly? Why can't you be normal like Mary Liza? Presently, I held them by their backs so they couldn't bite me while they pointed their wicked heads, almost turning completely around with their savage effort to avenge their capture. I was sure that these two had been fighting up in the tree. That's why they both fell so close together on Maggie Bell's dress. Have you ever seen them fight? I asked curiously. If I were to let them go this minute, they'd begin to fight instead of running away. I tilted my head sideways, studying their faces. Suppose we try them now. That's a great idea, Maggie Bell said as she sprang into action and built an improvised cockpit by spreading her pocket handkerchief upon the ground where I released the gladiators. Instantly, they more than justified my account of their ferocity by grappling, each rising to his full height and hurling himself at his opponent's throat. You see, they're more than acquainted with one another, I commented. I was the official umpire, manager, and promoter of the fighters. You see, Maggie Bell, they're just picking up where they left off up in that tree. Oh, it was an exciting display. Maggie Bell raised herself up on her elbows, and me, I moved closer and spread my hands flat on the grass to lean in over the arena. I peeped through a small magnifying glass that I had in my pocket as the two warriors fought with unbridled hatred for one another. Each wary advance and recoil from the first encounter, they would circle about at close quarters, each watching for his antagonist's weak point. Then the sudden clutch, embrace, and wrestle, which I, as the umpire, interrupted over and over again to prolong the combat. At length, I left the combatants to follow the bent in native savagery. They bit venomously below the belt. They grabbed at and hung onto any part of the body that came handy. They rolled over and over, intertwined so closely as if to appear like one convulsed devil monster. Finally, one of them gave a violent kick and went still. In that moment, the victor shook himself free of the carcass and we saw the head that he had bitten off from the other's neck roll from underneath the survivor. He walked an inch or two away from the remains and he sat up on his hind quarters, folding his legs and sanctimoniously reciting the battle prayer. After his devotions ended, he proceeded to lick his wounds and exit the arena. When my fixation ended, I lowered my magnifying glass and I found Maggie Bell staring at me in disbelief at the joy that was written on my face. Molly, I don't ever want to see a fight like that again. That just creeped me out. Well, I think it's interesting. It's not like they have souls anyway. They just die and they don't go anywhere, I replied. Just then, a disagreeable noise joined Bud's cooing and babbling and made both of us turn quickly. Right before us, within six feet, of the helpless baby who had sat up to regard the phenomenon with innocent wonder was an enormous sow with a brood of hungry young ones at her heels. Her vicious grunt and gloating eyes and dripping jaws with projecting tusks bespoke of her danger. Only yesterday I had seen her prowling in the barnyard when she seized and devoured one after another three small ducklings before the stable boy could beat her off 
In the terror of this moment, that scene flashed back to me, and I could still hear the crunching of those savage jaws. Quickly, Maggie Bell swooped down upon Bud and had him up on her shoulder before I could scream out like a silver trumpet. The wild beast halted and made as if though she would turn, but then she gave us an angry, squealing grunt and lunged towards us. There wasn't a loose stick or stone anywhere within reach, and even if there had been, there wasn't any time to pick it up. Run for the fence! Run! Maggie Bell bravely called out as she met the voracious brute with a kick so well aimed that the high heel of her shoe struck full upon the eye of the sow. During the respite that was gained by the sow's staggering recoil, Maggie Bell caught my hand and we fled along the path traced in the trampled broom straw. Which through we had waited merrily just a while ago, but we had only gone a dozen steps when the heart of the enemy was roaring behind us. I ran with all my might, thinking she would eat me and Bud, just the way she ate those ducks. I bet she'll eat me first, I thought, and I knew she meant it, and I knew it was true. The fence was no more than 50 yards away, but it looked to be a mile off, and the wild grass was tough and treacherous, as it had been pliant and sweet when we had first danced through it. Now, I was a swift runner, and my limbs obeyed me well. However, I was conscious of the strong pull of Maggie Bell's hand that lent wings to my feet every other step as she pulled. If I were to stumble, she wouldn't let me fall. Yet, the sow would have caught us had it not been for one of her pigs who let out a squeal as it lost its way and got entangled by the grass. The mother went back to reassure it with a series of staccato grunts, very unlike those she gave to us when she renewed the chase. Finally, we were at the fence and I scrambled over, spent and shaken, and hardly able to catch Bud as he was lowered down to me. Just then, Maggie Bell dropped in after us as our pursuer's snout was poked between the lower rails in a last and futile effort to get at the baby's fat legs. Seeing it, Maggie Bell's face flamed scarlet in a second. There was a pile of pea sticks that laid over in the fence corner. She grabbed one of them and jumped the fence again, wielding her weapon. She brought it down time and time again upon the ugly head and the raw bone body when the sow finally turned tail and ran. Just then, the conqueror returned to me. I held Bud tight in my arms, and we both laughed and cried together. We sat down on the grass, and she clasped the baby so close to her heart. He cooed joyously and held up his sweet open mouth for a kiss. No, but he didn't get one but twenty kisses upon his wet lips and his pink face and curly head. And then Maggie leaned over to give me one so long and tender. It was the first time I could ever remember someone kissing me like they cared.